So what we have to consider here is whose values are we thinking about? And I think it's very understandable that speech language pathologists are both a professional and a human who comes in with values, and some people say baggage, but we know in part of our brain that a feeding tube is not going to help, and yet another part of my brain seems to kick in and say, but you can't starve this person, you can't not give them food, you must listen to the family. What is my bias? I think we have to consider this. What's my scope of practice? And we have to compare carefully, where is my reasoning as a professional coming from first? Is it my worry about starving the patient? Am I staying within my scope of practice, which says that I can talk about feeding tubes and I should know about feeding tubes, but not that I should have the ultimate decision? And I've spoken about this before, we need to remind ourselves that it is the physician and family's decision about a feeding tube, no matter how much pressure is put upon the speech language pathologist. That's not to say you can't have a good role in explaining issues, but we need to be careful about stepping out of our boundaries. But what seems to have happened, and this may be partly because healthcare is viewed uh, in a commercial framework in this country, is that clinicians are now feeling they have to agree to everything a patient wants. This may go so far as to compromise their professional position. Autonomy for a person making a decision is not agreeing to everything the person wants, nor compromising an expert, that is the clinician's, position and role within the decision-making process. Autonomy is not about being a kid in a candy shop. Autonomy should be informed. I understand why I'm making the decisions I'm making. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the tension between autonomy and beneficence, and this is always going to exist. I'm going to talk about this concept of clinician disclosure and use a legal framework and I'm going to talk about what exactly informed consent means and I think there's still some lack of clarity around these concepts but understanding them better will help us to help our families in decision making. So thinking about information that we must technically disclose to patients. How does that work? A colleague of mine said to me this week, this disclosure thing, I've been thinking about something you said that many people say they were never told something by their physician. They were never told they were going to lose their voice after a laryngectomy. They were never told about getting infections following a feeding tube being put in their stomach. Well, is it that they weren't told, or is it that they don't remember? And if it's that they don't remember, that's not really our problem, is it? Well, I'm afraid it is our problem. In the United States of America, there are pretty much 25 states that operate under one legal standard of what's called physician disclosure, and roughly 25 states that operate under the other. The professional standard is the more traditional standard, if you like. So if someone decides to take a, a malpractice suit against you and say, I was never told about these consequences, if you're in a state that operates under the professional standard, that is, was the information I gave this patient what a uh, reasonably educated bunch of my peers would disclose. So I'm compared to my peers. Roughly half of the states look at it as, did I give the information to this patient that the patient needed? Did I give the information that they require, and did I enable them to understand it, that, so that they could make an informed decision? Now that's very different to did I simply do what most of my peers do? 
and it will be um, required of you to demonstrate that you gave information like a similar educated band of your peers in some states or if you're in the patient standard state that you document that you gave information to the patient in a way they understood and that fitted their needs for decision making. So if my value system says the feeding tube's not going to help, this is my personal thought and we saw this with the clinicians in the research and I personally don't think I'd want one, what are we doing when we encourage families to go for the alternative feeding routes? And we saw that clinicians would do that and actually there's research showing physicians who would not want things, don't think the evidence supports those decisions and yet with patients they'll still kind of push towards that feeding tube. And vice versa, if our values are life at any cost, and I know that my mother thinks like this, and she's a nurse and used to deal with um, uh, elderly patients, psychogeriatric patients as well, and she was, in her care of those people, she was very sensitive and very um, appropriate, but for herself, she wants feeding tubes, every tube going still. Um, so how are we presenting again this information to our patients and families? And again, staying within our scope of practice. And so, I'm sorry to say, it's like reading research papers, we need to really know our scope of practice in order to be able to stay within it.